So I am Andrew Dewar. I'm a performance psychologist with WSP. And so my purpose is to help people live better lives by improving their experience at work. And so I do that through uh, various projects, but a lot of uh, team and leadership development, as well as increasing collaboration across organisations. But today I've, I'm here to talk about the, the climate emergency. Um, it's a massive issue of our time and I want to help people basically by sharing a little of what I know about um, psychology. To explain the background, I've, I've spent quite a long time, probably over a decade, studying psychology through various degrees, particularly around motivation. That's like my area that I'm fascinated in. And I've applied that in organisational settings, not only through improving performance of teams, but also ch behaviour change, um, organisational change. And I developed a model which I'll talk about that I thought, oh, this will be great for organisations. But the biggest pull from, from clients and folks within WSP has been around sustainability. So we all know that technology um, and governments, councils, etc., are going to be key in changing the, the, the future and ensuring the various targets they're setting out and ultimately um, the future of our planet. But I'm here to talk about well, what can we do as individuals? How can we encourage individuals to to sort of um, rally to the call, as it were? So, yeah, that's what I talk about today. And specifically, there's a there's a really interesting concept in psychology um, called moral disengagement, and that helps us understand the behaviour around climate change. Moral disengagement is this subconscious thought pattern that stops us feeling guilt and shame with acts that we perceive to be immoral. So, for example, if you were to steal something or um, it's been studied in drug use as well, for example, our, our brains do this thing without us really knowing about it, where they justify those actions so we don't feel negative emotions. And it's part of the brain protecting us, as it does with all sorts of things in relation to confidence and whatnot. But I think the one that's really interesting for climate change is something called diffusion of responsibility. And that's this idea that it's that a problem or an issue is everybody else's responsibility, not mine. And so I wonder if you've ever been in a situation where you've asked a group of people to do something and it just doesn't get done. And that's because, you know, everybody else just kind of looks around and thinks, well, somebody else to do it. It's not my responsibility. But we use this to justify our acts as well. So if there's lots of people involved, um, we might feel less compelled to do something about it. And I think that's where it relates to climate change, because it is a it is a problem the world is facing. And so that mechanism of that, that bit in our mind is kind of working against us. And actually what we want to do is change that because we as individuals have to do something. Everybody has to do something. So we have to kind of understand that, you know, that we are working in the mind and try and combat that. And so I'll present some options for doing that today. Before we get any further, I want to just do a little experiment with you. Um, I'm going to trust, I can't see anybody at the moment, just check my screen. So I'm going to just trust that you're doing this and following along at home. So what I want you to do is just fold your arms, just in the way that's kind of normal and comfy for you. So you can see that for me. So now that you're doing that, now you're feeling comfy, maybe a bit relaxed, I want you to fold your arms the other way. So your hands go over in a different direction. And, you know, I knew this was coming, so I practiced it so I can do it. But it feels weird, it just does not feel comfortable. And it's just like a simple illustration of how even something like that can be difficult and uncomfortable for us. So change is difficult for people. And we need to recognise that and, and, and to an extent embrace that, but give people other options and understand it in a bit more depth uh, to in order to help them. And so one of the ways that we can do that is by looking at something called the intention behaviour gap. And if you think about um, news at near New Year's resolutions that you've made or commitments maybe at the start of the week to eat a bit more healthily or anything like that. You you want to do them, you know, you think about them, that's a goal that you've got, but lots of things get in the way and make that really difficult. And so this is not a criticism of anybody's willpower or lack of motivation or anything like that. This is quite the opposite, actually. This is saying, we can really want to do something, but lots of these other factors that you can see on the screen are actually something that stop us achieving the goals that we want. And the, the behaviour change model I'm going to talk about is a way of bridging that gap, is a way of helping people um, overcome these things 
in order to achieve the goals that they set out because particularly around changing our behavior um, it can be really difficult for people and there are a lot of things that we need to consider so if this helps a little bit uh, will help some people improve and we will move closer towards what we're wanting to achieve and so i'll give a brief overview of this and then i'll um, dive into each of the sections uh, as we go through but um, what I've tried to do is take there's loads of theories out there on, on behavior change and when you apply them to the right situation they can be really really effective and that might be what's right for you it might be about understanding the exact complexities of what you're facing and applying the right model or it might be one like this which is this is a more general model that tries to sort of be intuitively easy to understand and apply to lots of places and so that what basically what we're looking at is the direct stages where we we tell people where we want them to go what we want them that future state to be and then next we motivate them we encourage people to do the things that will lead them towards that future state and then next we we socialize that so we show people that others are doing the same as them they're doing the behavior that we've requested of them and what that does is it shows people um, that others are doing it and it helps because we're quite social creatures and these two steps to motivate and socialize we go around in those and what we do there is we the more we see other people doing it the more enc we encourage others to do the same they encourage other people and then the number of people um, doing something grows and grows and grows and you you'll find that in lots of things you know it an iPhone if you go back whatever it was 10 or 15 years it was only you know the real innovators that got the iPhone when it first came out and then we saw some people and then more people got it and it started to grow and grow in popularity then we've got the E stage so that is about supporting people's good intentions by making their decisions and actions easier and then at the bottom there we've got emotions because a lot of the a lot of the theory and the work out there and doesn't actually consider emotions or maybe doesn't optimize emotions and that's really key for us because we're quite emotional creatures as humans we think we're really rational but actually we're quite emotional and then we justify with um with thought and the, from the frontal cortex and uh, after that so emotions are key and let me just let me just bring that to life a little bit so you can you can see from the picture there if that person in the in the kayak is feeling fear and they've got a boat that's close to them then that fear is going to be useful for them it'll motivate them and move them um, towards the thing that they need but actually some of the messaging that i see around climate change uses a bit of fear or anxiety but it's tif difficult like i mean in this example there's a clear next step but in our climate change and how we change our behavior is there's a lot of options so fear doesn't directly lead us towards the next option that's going to be most useful and you know fear as a motivator works for things like insurance as well so you know insurance companies and their ad adverts and whatnot might say oh well if your pipe was to burst you'd be a really bad situation and so we get a bit anxious about that but then they say oh don't worry we'll take that anxiety away from you just a few hundred pounds whatever it is and, and you don't need to worry about that you can sleep at night so they they present the problem and then give you an immediate solution and then you can you can pay to just not have that but I'm not aware of any insurance for the environment or any direct thing that where we can just do something and it all be covered. So my suggestion is that we stop using fear or anxiety to try and coerce people on what we do. And instead we leverage you know, positive emotions that drive people towards a behavior. So things like excitement, pride, gratitude, or even anger. Anger can direct us towards something more than fear would. So, but what we want to try and do is leverage those positive emotions in order to get people moving um, and motivated to do what, we, what we're asking them to do. But we've got to give people that future state that we want them to achieve as well. And I think loads of organizations are doing uh, a great job of that. We're telling people where we want them to go. And it's just about setting that aspirational future direction and then engaging people along that journey in order to increase, increase that buy-in um, and make it something that they want to do and really getting them sold on the idea. What you can do here as well is you can learn good practice and then establish the important steps on the journey and then communicate and engage people on those to make it easier for people because 
um, they might agree with net zero, for example, but don't, don't understand what it is that they as individuals could do. And if you were to show them the milestones, then maybe that's the kind of thing that they could say, oh, I can help there or I can I can make this modification to my house or I can change this element of my behaviour. I can cycle to work two days a week or something like that. And then we've got motivate. Now, if we want sustained behaviour change, the, the best thing for that is intrinsic motivation, which is where we do something because we enjoy it. We just enjoy it for the sakes of it. And it's sort of part of our character as well. We see that as part of us. And what we what we how we would activate that is through positive and personally relevant messages that are tailored to that target audience. And so if you look at the screen here, which breakfast would you prefer? I should have done it for lunch, given the timing of this meeting, actually. But if you look at the at the colours, if you also look at the, the, the words I've used, so feel grown at breakfast feels like something that's intentionally positive. I think the colours look great, looks really appealing to me. The meat free breakfast feels like I'm missing out on something. Something's being taken away and also the colours are quite muted. It doesn't look doesn't look quite so good. It's maybe not so healthy. So it's just a really simple ex example to, to get you to encourage you to think, well, how are you positioning your messages? Are you positioning them as something where they're gaining a positive or where they're missing out on something, even if it's that if you're doing so unintentionally? Because as humans, we're really quite receptive to, to losing out on something. It's a, it's a bias called loss aversion. And so we want to avoid triggering that bias with negative wording or people missing out on something and instead move people towards that positive because it'll be more motivated and put more positive emotions means they're more likely to adopt the change that we're asking from them. In terms of the socialised stage, I said earlier, we are quite social creatures. We do as we see other people do. And, I, you know, I think the research suggests that that states back to, you know, when we lived in tribes and actually if you weren't part of the tribe, that was really negative for your survival. So that's why apparently that's why we're quite receptive to what other people think of us and, and, and working with other people. But we so we can use that to help encourage people to behave more sustainably. And what we would do in this situation is create a community either on a, on a local basis or online with people that we're, we've directed and motivated to do the same thing. So maybe it would be encouraging a particular street to, to take the bus to work or to cycle to work. And the more that we see other people in the street doing that, the more it becomes just the way people behave. It becomes what we call a norm, a normal way of acting. And then people, as they see other people doing that, they're much more likely um, to do that behaviour. And you're probably thinking, well, why am I showing bins when I'm talking about people taking the bus or cycling to work? And it's because to, <laughs> we moved house a few years ago and we never got one of those sheets that said, um, when are they recycling bins out? And it's every fortnight. And I always forget when they go out. So rather than going onto the website and putting my postcode and going through, you know, three or four screens to get the right, day, I just take the other bin out that goes out every week and I look around the street and I see if anybody else has got the recycling out. So that is just an example of how the behaviour of other people around us can influence what we do. And we can use that by encouraging other people to behave positively or sustainably in order for us to achieve our goals. And then the last stage is the ease stage. So we want to make the desired behaviour easier and more convenient for folks and we do that by simplifying messages and decision making so if we can make the messages really simple and straightforward uh, perhaps through things like rules of thumb or checklists or action plans that they've agreed ahead of time that makes things easier for people to follow through on their positive intentions when they're tired or hungry or, or a bit confused and there's a great example of this um, from lobster fishing in the bahamas and so they gave the, the folks there this tool to measure the lobster tails of spinning lobsters. And what that made it easy, what made them really, really easy to see which lobsters should be, can be caught and which of those weren't mature enough and should be released back into the, to the ocean. And for the first time in 40 years, they achieved close to zero undersized lobsters in their catch, which obviously had a massive positive benefit on the sustainability of that population. So again, another thing for you to think about is, well, how do you make 
sustainable behaviours easier for the folks that you're working with or the, the communities that you serve? Is there something like a tool or a or a rule of thumb or some or something that you could create that would make that easier for people? Doesn't doesn't need to solve the whole problem, just something to make it that little bit easier. So I recognise that's really quite theoretical up until this point, so I wanted to ground it in an example of a project that we did a few years ago. And so that was, we were commissioned by National Highways or Highways England as they were at the time to look at how we could drive positive behaviour change in the responsible sourcing of materials by their supply chain. And so uh, those of you who are aware of, of National Highways will know that, you know, there's a massive amount of spend and a massive amount of resources, but actually 90% of that is spent with delivery partners. So if we can encourage more responsible sourcing in those supply chain partners. There's a massive amount of positive benefit we can achieve from that for the, for the environment. So that was what was asked. And so how do we respond to that? Well, we, we did a piece of research at the beginning and we used our knowledge and experience um, that we've got within WSP, as well as researching into the, the guidance um, and standards in sustainable procurement and responsible sourcing to understand what best practice would look like. Then we built and baked in that behaviour change model into the project, not only in terms of the way we were working, but into the outputs that we created so that each one of those would drive people towards positive behaviours. We, National Highways, uh, they, have a, they have nine principles of responsible sourcing, and so we use them um, in order to understand what are the actions and behaviours that we're looking for across those nine principles. And then we worked with the supply chain in order to test out um, the, the thinking and approach, make sure we we're engaging with them early because it was ultimately going to be them that were self-assessing themselves in the maturity matrix. So it had to work for them and had to be right. And then next we created an action plan for national highways in order to help them implement and embed this with the supply chain partners going forward. And so this is an example, a piece of the of the maturity matrix, just in order to try and illustrate what we did. So we had those nine principles, but then we also got five themes, which are the foundation for looking at the organization's performance. And that's the five columns there. And then also there's the maturity levels, which show, you know, the increasing or the where the company is at the moment. And that's the rows that you can see from initial uh, down to leading. And it wasn't about everybody needs to score leading. That wasn't the intention here. It was about an honest self-assessment of where they were in terms of maturity in, in each of these themes for the for the nine principles. And the great thing about maturity matrix is they can see where they are, but also what the next stage is to get them uh, to improve and develop. And so that's what we created in order to help people understand their performance and then make steps. And we put that into a dashboard. And you can see an example here that's just some some kind of mock-up data. But what we did here is the, the if the line is more towards the outside edge of the uh, of the circle, that means it's a higher level of maturity, closer to the middle is, is lower. And you can see the nine principles that they've assessed their maturity levels on. And so what this does is it gives you a visual that they can look at and think about and prioritize the actions as the supply chain partners. And it might be that they target the elements that are that are lowest. So in this example, social value seems quite low. So they would say, okay, what actions can we do to improve our maturity and social value? Or it might be one of the other elements. Um, so for example, you know, organizational and human management is quite high, but it's really important for the future. And then they could prioritize actions for that as well. So it's just a case of helping people understand how they're performing creating an, uh, a situation where they assess that and then give them the steps as supply chain partners for what they can do to be even better in the future. And then the final deliverable as, as that project was was the action plan for um, Highways England or National Highways. And we, we created these kind of milestones. So these have specific actions that, um, that sit under each of these milestones. And we worked with, it was a great collaboration with the client, which we really enjoyed. Um, in order to create not only the milestones, but the actions that sit underneath in a detailed action plan. And so you can see some are down to Highways England, some were down to the supply chain and some were a mix. 
um, between those two organizations that they could achieve together. But what this did was it leveraged the, the direct and motivate stages of the uh, behavior change model. So we're saying to people, this is the future state, look at the, you see the milestones as we go on, and then we've even got specific actions for people that they could uh, they could complete to try and advance. So all of those things direct and motivate people. We would then encourage them to communicate that out to others in order to show and socialize these ideas and give examples of how other people have done so. And so you would see that through that we do set the direction in terms of direct, complete a pilot, you know, small scale something, get some good um, positive experiences and then share that with the rest of the community in order to increase the amount that that happens and build on that positive momentum. Okay, so that's just a quick summary of one of the projects that we've done, that we've completed with a client in order to try and change that behaviour. Just wonder, um, are there any questions that you wanted to ask? Anything about that um, the content that I've presented or anything else? Andrew, if I may, a question from me. This this perhaps won't happen all the time, but I can understand in working with a key client, a key organisation like that. Sometimes it may be about opening the mind of an individual or a couple of individuals rather than a group. Have you experienced anything like that? And, and is, is that the case or, or is it that you need that group buy in as it were? Yeah, that, that's a really interesting piece and it's something um, that I'm facing on the moment at a project I'm doing. We're trying to transform part of the organisation and some people are really willing. They really think, oh, this is great, totally up for it. Other people are a little bit more reluctant. And if you look at um, that piece around early adopters, it tends to follow this, this curve of some people are keen early on, others aren't so. And there's basically two ways of dealing with that. One is to say, do you know what? We're always going to have some people who are a bit resistant, but if we've got more than 50% of people who are bought in and are doing stuff, then that will just kind of carry us through. And actually, as other people who are maybe a bit resistant, they start to see other people doing it, they try it themselves. OK, they'll come along, you know, and eventually they'll come with us. And actually, for the most part, I would say that's that's approach I would take. However, you might have a real key stakeholder who's really who you need to convince and actually you need to maybe you haven't done the engagement or you do need to work more closely with that individual. And so then I'd be thinking, OK, well, what are they saying? What do they need? What is what are their goals for the situation? And really trying to listen because, yeah, what I talked about today is a little bit of a tell but there's so much value in listening to people's perspective and, and seeing it from their eyes and can you create a common ground could you modify something to make it more comfortable for them because that's you're so, you're not you're not doing this intentionally but that's going to generate positive emotions because people they want everybody i think wants to be listened to so if you listen to them understand that perspective then they're more likely to follow you on that journey so i'll probably say a combination of both approaches which is spend most of your time trying to get it right for most people but then do look out for those key people who are you know a bit unsure and just spend some time with them and try and understand their perspective interesting yes yeah, thank you andrew okay. thank you um <clears throat> aaron said i would like to ask a bit more about the pilots with highways england and what the outcomes that were intended i have unmuted you unmuted you aaron um we'll let you unmute so if you do want to add anything else please shout I'll, I'll answer the initial question and then Aaron, yeah, you know, please come back and, and ask a bit more. Um, so what did they, they ask is initially was to to create the maturity matrix in order to, so they could implement that with the supply chain. So it was um, and then also to do the action plan for the for the implementation. So it was that early research piece to, to create those deliverables, working with and engaging with all the key people in order to set them up for success in the future. What I need to do, which I haven't done, is, um, is go back to the client contact and say, well, how did you get on? What, what changes have you noticed? Um, and that kind of thing. So the the intention of the project was to create the products and what we need to do is just check in with National Highways and see how that's landed with folks and what more support we can give. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Uh, no, thank you very much for that. Um, I should probably have 
phrase my question a wee bit better. The bit I was more interested in was how you get the supplier buy in for the pilots and how you got the measured that comes from that. Um, so that was my my bad for tabulating the question. Well, absolutely. Yeah. Again, I need to take in with the detail. My current project is the SMP Alliance, and what I've found working with the supply chain there is that they're very keen to get buy in. They're very keen to do things and to um, to be involved. It's the the challenge will be how do you measure that that impact? You know, how do you measure that that change? Um, so, like I say, yeah, great question, and I'll need to go. I'll, what I'll do is I'll email the I'll, I'll email and see if I can get a response, see what's changed, then I'll come back to you with that. Right, thank you. Thanks. Um, got another question. How do you go about lessons learned? Is there an issue of who to include and who to inform? Mm, that's a really interesting question. I think there's always a there's always a challenge with lessons learned in terms of there's always a challenge with any meeting how many people you get involved in a particular discussion. Um, Teams has made that easier from some respect. You can have more people in a meeting. So we've got, I don't know, 30 odd people on the phone today, but is that meaningful contribution from everyone? And the way I tend to get around that is to do something like issue a survey or ask questions with a group or team in terms of collecting those ideas and then looking for commonalities and then probably working with a, with a working group or a smaller group who can then transfer those, who can represent the wider group transfer it into actions and then move things forward. So that would be my thoughts would be to try and canvas um, the thoughts of a wider group through the likes of Menti or some other soft uh, survey software and then work with the group to say, well, is that what you're seeing? Um, is, is that something that applies to you? So for, for example, at the moment I'm working on something called improving behaviours, improving performance, which is a national highways approach to developing high performing teams. And so they can they measure um, six key behaviours which drive performance on projects. And so we send out this questionnaire to the whole the whole scheme or the whole team. We ask them to complete and then we take a, the leadership team or a smaller group together to talk about the results, the impact of those and then the action plan going forward. So that's an approach that's worked well, not only to help people see what's really happening to get that wide opinion, but also to drive actions and say, OK, well, this is what we need to do going forward. So, John, I hope that answers your question, but feel free to, um, you know, let me know if there's anything else. Thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah, if anyone has, if John, if you want to follow up or if anyone else has any questions, just post them in the chat, please. I'll just do some housekeeping whilst um, we wait for any more questions. Um, so the slides and recording will be uploaded onto the SharePoint site and the Teams site. Um, if you don't have any, if you don't have access to these channels, please let me know. Um, but I will be sending out a follow up email, um, which will also have a feedback survey and links to these sites um, after the webinar ends. Um, I don't think we've had any more questions through. I'll just give it another minute and then. Be interesting to hear from folks if you do have projects planned that you think would be, be looking to target individuals, if you get anything planned that's looking to change behaviour or, or what is you, the focus of the work you're doing at the moment? Is it technology based, policy based or people based? So any, any thoughts around that or anything that, that you think would be helpful in that space would be interesting. Clive, if you want to uh, unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, Clive Campbell from uh, Caerphilly County Borough Council. Uh, an issue facing all local authorities, many public bodies, um, is the rollout of electric vehicle charging infrastructure for electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be a, a fairly major change in behaviour required of all of us. Um, and any ideas on how to uh, smooth that transition would be appreciated because there's anybody who's looked into this will will have heard the expression range anxiety. Yep. Uh, and my personal view is that um, there needs to be an element of behaviour change 
but as much as close as we can get to current behavior for fueling of fossil fuel vehicles that we can match that with electric vehicle charging the better so that people not everybody wants a charger outside their house if you don't have an um, off street parking yeah yeah that's interesting because my thought immediately went to long journeys when you asked that question and i think you know that's what some people are thinking about but there's also the you're exactly right how, how do you charge outside your own home do you need to etc cetera, etc cetera. I, I think there's there's two things so the first thing is you know i've got a good friend of mine drives an electric car and he said you just have to change the way you think about refueling and that is how many times do you do a trip that lasts more than 200 miles so like some cars do 200 miles most most of the new ones do for example and and the answer my answer to that is not very often if, if i'm honest so you change the way you refuel your car to well i just keep driving until it you know gets in the red and then i just find one of these very conveniently located petrol stations and i put that in into i charge it when is needed within that range be if i'm lucky enough to have a charger in my house i do that at night time or i find a place to charge it in a local network so it's changing the mindset from i'd want this thing to be ready when i demand it or when i've run out of fuel into a little bit more planning um, and a little bit of i change my routine so i charge it and it's ready to then go 200 miles rather than it's it's always i'll always be able to get fuel and the second thing is i guess um what could we can we kind of stack other positive behaviors or other behaviors that we would want with the recharging um can we encourage drivers to take a break and have the safety element if they're having a long journey um the faster chargers making that closer to the to the time that we would stop anyway is really really helpful um there's a fantastic thing from it was an example in, in lifts I forget which country but basically they wanted the lifts to be faster in some office block because people were getting really frustrated waiting for a lift and well, instead of making the lifts faster they put in mirrors because they realized that people would look at themselves and amuse themselves while the lift came and the perception was that the lifts had got faster the only thing they had changed was the mirrors now i'm not suggesting we put mirrors up everywhere we would put charging points but could we put something that would be of interest to pass the time quicker so that coupled with a bit of a mindset change but also a bit of a well, what could we add to make this a more positive experience um some manufacturers are making the cars easier to to position so you can have a nap which i don't think is ideal from a psychology point of view i think we want to do things could we could we create a green space so uh, while you're charging your car you get you know five to ten minutes of um a bit of fresh air on a journey for example or, you know good good amenities that people can use that type of thing that's for the long journeys for the shorter journeys yeah how do we how do we tie that in in a sense of could we create community spaces where people have positive interactions and they get to know their neighbors because we've got a common charging point um we'd have to have to consider safety you'd have to look at that in more depth but we could look at this problem and other issues that we're facing in society and think well is there a common something that we can do put together both of those things and create something that would be quite innovative you know and a chance to engage with your community for example i agree with all of that and um it's interesting comment in the chat there as well uh, it's as much as we can um, integrate with people's existing patterns of uh, of behavior the better so it, it is instead of being used to that five or ten minutes at the uh, petrol station it's it's going to be 20 minutes if you're lucky an hour or more depending on how much charge you want and every time you go to the petrol station you don't always fill up so it's drawing those parallels that okay you don't always fill up so you don't always need a full charge get it out while you're out and about so you, the infrastructure needs to be where people go so the things like um, uh, community centers uh, leisure centers uh, sh shopping centers that kind of thing the infrastructure isn't there yet to build that level of confidence but it's that's that's my thinking as far as possible you make it as easy as possible to do it as part of their normal day rather than having to plan everything around how to, how to charge their vehicle yes absolutely 
Yeah. But it's 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 combating that fear and, and uh, improving people's confidence levels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. I just oh, sorry, you go. No, I was just going to say I was just thinking about how you do that. You, you know, just stories from people that you trust and it'll happen more as as more people more people that we know drive electric cars and it'll make it something more appealing to us. But, you know, case studies that you could imagine um, examples of, of families that are adopting electric cars and how that how they fit that into their lifestyle. If you create short videos of something like that, um, you could do it for different, you know, different people, different groups of people that might help the increase in, the, in the changing that mindset. Just as an aside, um... I'll, I'll use uh, EV charging, but I think it applies to lots of things. Combating social media, because uh, there's good and bad in it. But uh, if you have a thousand stories of people who've had a good experience with an electric vehicle, and then you get one post or tweet that says, oh, I had an awful experience. There was the, the charges weren't working. I got stranded. Then that's the message that the, or the perception that goes out uh, and it's very difficult to combat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. And I think it's one of those things where maybe we have to meet those questions or challenges head on and say, OK, well, what is what is people's biggest concern around electric? And that idea of I think it's anybody's biggest, it's my biggest concern in a car. Um, I don't want to get stuck at the side of a road. Um, and we're not we're not really used to that, I would say, if you if you have a modern car. I mean, I've been driving for what twenty years now and I've never broken down, touch wood. Um, so how would we address that? How do we teach people to avoid those things? How do we um give them you know, because we've got great guidance on well how what should you do if you travel in the snow, for example? You should, you should go prepared. So maybe it's just about a bit more preparedness for folks and, and how they can do that. Okay, we've got a couple of questions come through. Um, is there any evidence to back up the perception that older people are less willing to change? That's a great question. I, I'm not aware of any off the top of my head. I'd have to do a quick Google Scholar search to see if they've actually examined that. Um, I would imagine it's very person specific or not person specific, more context specific, because I actually think depending on people are different but mostly we're willing to change for things that we desire that will be a reward for us being some way good and less willing to change for things that we don't um so yeah short answer not sure i'll have to have go go and have a look but what an interesting question um how great is the effect of others adopting an action is there any relative points of uptake that bring about a snowball effect so I think, yeah, they, they study this in, in, in various things. They've, you know, the classic studies are reuse of towels and bedding in hotels and using saying how people who stayed in this room reuse their towels and sheets, you know, to reduce the water and the, and the energy consumption, for example. So that would have some kind of measure or benchmark. You would need, we'd need to look into the specific question that you're looking to answer to know what the benchmark and potential behaviour change could be. So for things that will be, you know, well established, well, there's been 10 studies on this and we see a benefit of, you know, X percent, we could make a reasonable guess. Um, we wouldn't want to make a generalised, um, you know, guess as to what would be for anything. So we need to look at the details. But if that's something that you'd like to, to look into in more depth, then just uh, drop me an email and we can continue that conversation. How do you think social media's influence how do you think social media influencers can be used to forward ideas to a larger audience? It's kind of it's kind of what they do, isn't it? Like that's <laughs> that's their job is communicating those ideas to a larger audience, and and how we use that to a positive effect um, is a really interesting question. I think, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not I'm not a massive social media user. I have to say that's not an area of expertise, but if off the top of my head, if I had to make a guess, it would be convincing those individuals that something's important and encouraging them to try and share that with those community, that, that community that they have. Could you show that person changing their behaviour, showing everybody how easy it is in order to encourage that behaviour? 
I'm blanking on an example. I'd, I'd love to be able to off the top of my head say, well, I knew this influencer did X and then this happened. But it must be happening because that's, that's a way people are making money is by suggesting products and people are buying those products. So could we leverage that case for good uh, and show how that person's making that change in their daily life in order to how, help other people make that same change too? There will always be the caveat is that people always know the influencers have more money. So if I thought about something like if I saw an influencer with a ground source heat pump, that might make me less likely to change because I would say, yeah, but they've got loads of money and they can do all these things. I don't have loads of money. So we'd have to be careful with what we would ask people to do and, and what that change would be. OK, um, do you need to employ different techniques depending on the size of the group whose behaviour you're trying to change? Is it harder to influence a large group of people or an individual? I think it's. I think it's definitely easier to influence an individual because, you know, as we're talking with Mark, you can really just get into the detail of what it is, that, where that person is, what are they thinking, what are they feeling, what do they want, can you match that with what you want and can you bridge that gap and, and move forward together. That's easier with an individual because you can really understand them and there's um, a great technique called motivational interviewing, which is, you know, asking those questions to get the answer, that you, that, that, to get their truth basically in order to then meet their need. So they've used that in um, you know, various uh, therapeutic things like alcohol recovery and that type of thing. In terms of the, the group size, um, I think the techniques, would, there'd be a lot of engagement techniques that you can employ. So that would be, you know, how do you how do you make that vision engaging? That might be through visual, uh, visual media, so pictures, videos, that kind of thing. Um, and it, but there will also be a readiness element as well. So could you assess the group for readiness to change um, through some surveys? You wouldn't need to get the whole group, but if you could survey some of the group, you could then make some understanding. Essentially, it's all coming down to what is the what is the piece that you're trying to do and what are the milestones? So what are you trying to get to and what are the milestones? And then so that if you present that, what are, bef before you do that, thinking about what, who you're working with. What do they want? What's their perspective and get their thinking a little bit. And so then trying to understand and address any concerns, maximise the benefits for them. It's a classic what's in it for them type of approach. And so those group, those techniques might scale. If it's an individual, you could have a one to one meeting. If it's a group of 10, you could have a team's meeting. You could still get ideas. You get much more than that. You're going to have to look at the likes of surveys or other things. And if you get into the thousands, then you may, maybe you need surveys with you know, AI that would that would do the data analysis for you. But there are all those things that, that can be done and, and can work. Um, there's some, and even actually, if you look at what people are doing online, the likes of, I think it was Expedia, they did, they do tests, they are always doing testing. What does this color of blue, how does that impact how you click through to the next stage? You know, what are all these things in terms of colors, shapes? What is there in terms of messaging? they because they've got thousands hundreds of thousands of users they are testing one situation versus another so if you're dealing with a massive population like that and, and you're doing it online then you can do some really exciting um, experiments showing what is most likely to get people to interact and engage with your content how long do people engage with it for um, and then you can do all sorts of awesome stuff with that okay great some great questions there um mm. So I think we haven't had any more through. Um, so I think we end the session there. Um, I think Andrew on the slides, your um, email address is on there. So if anyone does have any follow up questions, please feel free to, to email Andrew. Yeah, Mark, please do. Come in? Just, just to say thanks to everyone for attending. Thanks for Alice for steering us forward. And obviously Andrew for some really thought provoking content there. Um, <laughs> I'll pick up on how do we change behaviour with the dog who's now asleep. So apologies <laughs> for that at the beginning, but maybe that's a good metaphor for how you've led us through uh, the session today. Re really interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thanks. Thank Alice. you. All right. Thanks, thanks everyone. everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.